So, good evening, uh, everybody. Franco Bifo Berardi uh, is one of today's major Italian theorists and activists in the communist and post workerist tradition. You became a member of the Communist Youth Federation at the young age of 13, but soon after were expelled due to factionalism. Um, you then studied uh, aesthetics at the University of Bologna, um, where he also participated in the events of May 68. Uh, soon after, he became acquainted with uh, Tonio Negri and um, became part of the Potero Paraio movement, uh, which is the radical autonomous workers' movement uh, in Italy in the 70s. Um, like many other participants uh, of this movement, uh, Franco had to flee to uh, Paris in order to um, avoid imprisonment, like many others. And there he soon became close friends with uh, Félix Guattari, um, to whom you then dedicated a book, and um, with whom you worked in Schitt's analysis in the 70s and 80s. Um, I'd say Guattari uh, liked the whole um, theoretical climate uh, in par Paris of the 70s, was a major influence on Franco's thought. Um, Yet I think what renders this oeuvre so particular and interesting is um, that you draw your influences also from various other fields. And these other fields include, uh, for instance, um, punk rock music, uh, the cyberpunk um, uh, literary um, scene, communication theory, um, computer programming and code, uh, and also his collaborations uh, with many uh, publication media in the field of contemporary arts like Eve Lux, for instance, but also many others. Franco himself uh, also was involved in the foundation of a number of publishing and media enterprises, such as, for instance, Bologna's first free pirate radio station, Radio Alice, and after you also became involved in the foundation of uh, the TV station Orfeo TV, uh, which was um, the first of the Italian Tete Street um, movement that set up free TV stations, um, in several cities in order to allow associations and individuals to use uh, TV for group uh, benefits. Franco has written over 20 books uh, on many different topics. I will not uh, tell them to you, you can uh, look them up, but uh, just tell you maybe that the common thread in almost um, all of these books is his focus on how the arts, uh, sciences and technologies, uh, and when I say technologies I mean um, not only um, um, yeah, AIs and uh, this stuff, but also technologies like social media and um, telecommunication, but also the technologies of uh, economic theory that uh, Franco describes as, as a technology, um, interact with our understanding of ourselves and our desires. Uh, his work is particularly timely and addresses uh, the pressing questions of our present, like uh, the talk that we are hearing tonight. <coughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you, Yvonne for your introduction. Um, let's say that my impression is that we live in the age of the vengeance, la vendetta. Mm? The vengeance of the, of the humiliated, the vengeance of the um, impoverished, the vengeance of the impotent. Do you, do you think that what is happening in the world in Austria, in, in this can, country, but uh, also uh, almost everywhere in Italy, like in the United States, in India, like in the Philippines, in Brazil, like in the United Kingdom, in Poland, like uh, in uh, France, more or less, and so on. Do you think that this is a comeback of fascism? I don't think so. Um, fascism was essentially a phenomenon of uh, euphoria, of uh, aggressiveness and optimism. Fascism was a phenomenon of a young population of uh, people who wanted uh, to win a world of expansion, of conquest, of, uh, um, of, uh, of growth at the end. The concept of growth, the concept of economic growth is central 
in the definition of the fascism of the past. Fascism is the push towards an expansion which was, was based on youth, on a young population, a young demography, and on the possibility of economic growth. These two conditions have disappeared nowadays, with the remarkable exception of Africa and of the Islam world, the human population is uh, aging, is growing old. And uh, at the same time, the prospect of economic growth has become totally utopian. I, I think that at the very end, the experience of the so-called neoliberalism, which in my opinion is essentially absolute capitalism of, or capitalist absolutism, is an attempt to relaunch the impossible growth, an attempt to relaunch a growth that has become impossible and so has to be relaunched with the reduction of wages, with the destruction of the welfare state, with the destruction of the planetary environment, and so on. But now, after 30 years of neoliberal aggression, the exhaustion has become totally evident, exhaustion, physical exhaustion of the planet nervous exhaustion of the cognitive brain. What happens now in the moment of exhaustion? The, 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 the wave of Trumpism, this kind of uh, fake comeback of uh, fascism, this kind of funky, fascism, desperate, funky fascism, is based on the consciousness of the exhaustion. It's uh, the fascism of the old. I know that many young people are following Salvini and Trump uh, and your fascist uh, whose name I don't uh, remember. But that's not the problem. Young people now come, come to the fore as uh, people who have no future. So the condition of uh, a senescence, of senility, is a condition that is totally uh, dominant in, in the... In 2016 has been the year in which the vengeance of the impotent has uh, won everywhere in the world, starting from Washington and London, then uh, uh, in New Delhi and, and, uh, and Rome and so on. But if we want to understand 2016, we have to think to summer 2015, at least in Europe. We have to think to the summer of the Greek humiliation, the summer in which democracy has been finally destroyed in the very country where 2,500 ago, years ago, the idea of democracy had been, had been conceived. The end of democracy, the humiliation of democracy, the humiliation of the impoverished population of Greece, of the impoverished population of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, Europe. This is the beginning of that kind of reversal, of uh, 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 sudden reversal of the, of the historical scene that happens in 2016. Weimar 
at you, uh, Europe at Weimar, or European Weimar, I don't know how do you prefer, uh, is the title of this meeting. A, 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 a title that is a little bit frightening, and uh, a, a title that aims maybe to scandalize what kind of Nazism are we waiting for? You know, the historical fascism of the past uh, uh, century was based uh, on that kind of violence, which is the violence of young people. That kind of civil war was the civil war that is possible to energetic young people who have a future to discover and to assert with the possibility of expansion. But expansion is over. Future is over. This old punk scandal, no future, has become common sense in the majority of the people of our time. So, I don't expect uh, that kind of civil war that we have been knowing in the past century. The main form of violence nowadays is suicide. The main form of uh, terrorist aggression nowadays is the mass murder of a suicidal person who kills 50 people just because he wants to kill himself. That is the new feature, the new sense of uh, civil war nowadays. Sometimes, maybe, or maybe not, suicide may become the nuclear suicide of a Nazi party that is governing uh, a country of 1 billion, 300 million people, India of Narendra Modi, a person who belongs to a party which has been funded with the money of Adolf Hitler, and is the same party of the person who killed the, the Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, you know, we were saying with a friend before, with my friend Clemens, that uh, the, the 20th century has been short from a certain point of view. The century of the hope, of the transformation, the century of socialism has been short. But uh, in a sense, the 20th century has never really finished. It is here, but it has been uh, uh, delivered to a humanity which is uh, a humanity of, uh, of old, impotent, humiliated people. So what? Someone may tell me, I will, I will finish in five minutes, someone may tell me that uh, there is hope in Rome. There is hope in London. Salvini has been defeated, they say. Boris Johnson is going to disappear in a few weeks. But, you know, the problem is that I don't see a, a vision a, and I don't see a possibility of relaunching a project of social transformation. And also, I see that uh, what will happen in the United Kingdom, what will happen in Italy, depends much more from uh, the drone that bombed the oil uh, stations in Saudi Arabia yesterday than from the election in London or in Rome. I mean, the, 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 the prospect of our future is the prospect 
of a society which has replaced the socialist expectation with the suicidal despair. So what? Should I stay here to preach uh, bad, uh, bad uh, to, to dream bad uh, uh, nightmares and to propose uh, bad imaginations? I don't like that. Frankly speaking, I, I, I think that I should stop going around uh, fire, uh, to, to, to make this kind of talks, but my friends invite me and I am happy to meet my friends and I hope they don't believe me. But one final thing I want to say, and the final thing comes from a poet, an Irish poet, a Christian and an anarchist, who wrote a poem titled The Second Coming, in which uh, he describes, uh, it was the year 1919, and the poet is William Butler Jarth. And he says uh, in that poem that uh, the best lack all convictions. The worst are full of passionate intensity. Well, it's a, 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 good, uh, a good way to describe the present situation, if you want. But the poet says also that the apocalypse is here. The apocalypse of the First World War, of the Irish famine, of the, of the explosion of the Spanish flu in the world, that apocalypse of hundreds of years ago. So, what will happen next? And Jacques answers, replies his questions, saying the apocalypse will be followed by the second coming of Christ. As we know, Jesus did not come. Hitler did. So, the second coming, the, we have to... Imagine now is the second coming of what has been attempted in the past century. The second coming of an experiment in transforming senescence, transforming depression, transforming and growth in a possibility. Because depression is a possibility. Senescence is a possibility. And most of all, and growth is a possibility. If we are able to question the very foundation of the modern society, the push towards expansion, the push towards uh, growth, the push towards accumulation, that push has to be declared dead. And we have to be able to distinguish between what can be changed and what can only be transformed in a mental way into a possibility. And growth and the end of accumulation may become the starting point of a new age of frugality, of uh, a transformation of time into, into lazy time without work. Obviously, these words sound crazy and empty at the present, but the apocalypse is coming. The apocalypse is here, frankly speaking, and the trauma will change the mind of those who have not had the potency to change the world 
and are obliged, are forced to find a new prospect, a new potency in the impotence itself. Thank you very much. Grazie. Thank you, Bifo. Um, uh, I would now maybe shortly see how many of you have questions. Just if, if everybody can raise it. I will first, I have you on my list. Uh, okay, only one question. So then, uh, <laughs> uh, um, to, okay, no, it was only to see how much time I have uh, in, in order to ask you questions, and then I have you too already. Um, okay. Yeah, Franco. <laughs> As you said, um, your friends are not happy with your apocalyptic turn. Um, with? with your apocalyptic turn. Also, um, the first time we met, uh, I was trying to pressure you uh, to endorse a more um, optimistic uh, scenario and to maybe... I, I forgot your proposal. <laughs> and uh, to maybe uh, endorse um, yeah, more the rhetoric of uh, potency and possibilities and less of uh, despair and uh, suicide. But then you answered me and that impressed me a lot. Um, Therefore, I'm telling it here now that you are not intimidated by the blackmailing of activism. Uh, so I wanted to ask you to maybe uh, elaborate a bit more on that. Because in preparation of our talk here tonight, I also was um, re-scrolling your books and actually found a citation in a similar direction already in your book from 2011, After the Future. Uh, where towards the end you're writing um, that you cannot tell a happy end because that would be cheating and uh, that you are not born to strategy but to theory and that means that you have to tell the truth and not try to uh, make things up in order to uh, give people hope or, or that uh, thing. So maybe you could uh, elaborate a bit more on that. And uh, as a second question, I would maybe combine that uh, with, you were referring to the Sex Pistols uh, in your talk also, um, no future, um, save the queen. Um, and yeah, the future or the end of the future has been a topic of your work over the years, um, but I think uh, it has radically changed uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, because so far you have always stressed that the future is in our expectations and uh, also in your 2017 book, Futurability, you are um, still um, yeah, trying to see the plurality of the possible notwithstanding our impotence. Um, so the question would be, what has changed in the last two years? Uh, and uh, uh, is there no place for activism anymore or... Um, <coughs> How, how would you say that? And how do you put it together with in, in other um, parts you anyhow still claim that there's a huge need um, um, or you're calling for a new internationalism uh, which you call um, the indispensable utopia. So how, how do the two go together? Uh, I mean, there's a tension, an evident tension between these two concepts maybe so far. Uh. Well, what has happened in the last two years. Uh, well, in the, in the last two years, some, some few things have happened. Yeah. Nevertheless, uh, yes, it's true, I am not in the business of hope. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> I must say that also the professional of hope, uh, whose name is Francesco, like me, but he is Pope, in, in the first interview he gave uh, after becoming uh, a Pope, um, a beautiful interview, believe me, in La Civiltà Cattolica, one of the magazines I read uh, every, every week. Um, not true, but in that case, I read La Civiltà Cattolica, the interview with Antonio Santoro, a beautiful interview in which Francesco says, well, maybe that God, uh, I interpret, not exactly, what Francesco said, but it's my interpretation of uh, his words. And uh, he says, maybe God is busy 
somewhere and he cannot take care about us. So faith is not really the problem. Not really the point. We should not stress the problem of faith, says more or less Francesco. And when faith is not the problem, so hope becomes very weak. We should not go around proposing hope to people that is useless. So what is left? And he says, compassion, charity. That is what is left. We should not go around convincing people, persuading people of something. We should not communicate the faith in a God. We must touch the body of our brother. We must act as a camp hospital. The war is in the world and our task, the task of the Christian church, is going around helping people physically, heal people, not talk about God. Um, at the same time, I must say that I am not in the business of hope, but I think that the possibility exists. The possibility is there, is here, is everywhere. The possibility is in the brain of the cognitive class of 100 million people in the world who have programmed the global machine and who have the power, the possibility, the, the intellectual ability to dismantle the global machine and to reprogram the global machine. I mean, that the possibility of a world without exploitation is at hand, is in our brains, the possibility. But the possibility means nothing if you don't have the potency to transform the possibility into an actuality. Our problem is essentially a problem of potency, is essentially a problem of transforming the possibility into an actuality. This is the conundrum we are, we are uh, dealing with. The huge force, the huge productive force of uh, the cognitive capitalism has exploited the intellectual force of 100 million people in the world. Those 100 million people have the possibility, but do not have potency, because potency, potency is something that belongs to the body, to the soul, to the, to the, to the psychic mind, to the unconscious, to the collective unconscious. So potency, is presently destroyed by fear, by impotence, by the inability to transform the senescence of the world into the pleasure of sobriety and laziness. So my, my expectation, not my hope, but my expectation is that the present apocalypse is going to transform something at the level of the collective brain. Someone like Catherine Malabou speaks of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, not politics, is uh, the, the, the tool that can open a new prospect, perspective, perspective. I mean, neuroplasticity means that the collective brain of the humankind inside the trauma that is coming, will be able to find a way to transform the possibility into an actuality. It's important to know that the possibility is there. It's important to know that it is only a problem of potency. Only, you, you say only, it's not easy. It's much more a problem of psychotherapy. 
than a problem of politics. Ask one further question uh, there because it connects well to what you said: um, potency and uh, therapy. Um, um, as we are here, or let's let's start differently. Um, in your abstract for the event, you also made reference to the automaton, and uh, during your work, uh, you always uh, describe technology, however, in a ambiguous way. On the one hand, it gives us the possibility to overcome the pressures to go to work. Yeah? We can dismiss labor, actually, that's the positive side, because then we would have more time to re-weaver the social web and uh, reconnect with our desires. On the other hand, uh, the automation of language uh, also restricts uh, enormously uh, our imagination. And um, as you said, potency, um, I mean, one of your topics also was the the emancipatory um, potency of poetry and the arts. And as we are here uh, in, an, in an arts institution, I wanted to ask you that maybe um, you could elaborate a bit more on how poetry or the arts uh, could um, contribute uh, to enlarge this potency via uh, enlarging our imagination. Also, with the body, uh, you made reference to the body and the intellect. Uh, there's a, a citation from you that says, uh, the general intellect is looking for a body. And who constitutes this body? No, I mean, um, what's, what's the role of the arts uh, here in um, trying to re re-describe uh, our connections to our body and our desires? Yeah. You know, I have a problem. That my, my bestseller, my personal bestseller, I'm joking, of course, uh, is a book uh, published in the year 2011 titled The Uprising. It has been published also in German, mm. I guess. Uh, I like that book. But it's a book that I wrote under the impression of a global movement called the Occupy, La Campada, Indignados. I don't know. That movement has been an enormous experience, a political experience, I don't think so. At the political level, the movement of Occupy has been a, a miserable failure, think to Egypt, just to name one case, think to everywhere, think to uh, Wall Street and Oakland. For one month, people were occupying the streets, then what happened next. So, a political failure. But at the same time, Occupy has been the first attempt in changing the relation between the possibility and the potency. Calling people in the streets uh, were totally useless from the political point of view. Power is not in the streets. It's no more in the streets. Power is nowhere. Not even in the banks. Power is in the cyberspace, in the, in the network connection between figures and logarithms and algorithms and I don't know what else. So, politically, it was uh, useless, but the problem of Occupy was totally different. The problem of Occupy was a sort of call to the collective body of the cognitive class. The, of the cognitarians. It was a call to people to find again the, the pleasure of being together in the street, in the place, in, in some strange, totally impotent place. Uh, then what happens? You know what happens after, after Occupy. So that first attempt has failed. What now? Now the apocalypse. But that does not mean that the possibility has disappeared. So we should be able to go back to the possibility and to reactivate the body of the general, of the general intellect. Uh, in that uh, lucky but uh, in somehow, somehow misleading book, the uprising, I speak of poetry, 
like uh, like a, a way of react to reactivation of the of the body of the cognitive uh, uh, um, of the cognitive class uh, yes but what is the meaning of the word poetry in that case uh, um, it it sounds there is the danger of a Swedish interpretation poets artists uh, uh, um, who cares about them? No, the point uh, is uh, that poetry means uh, what uh, of language cannot be com 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 computerized, what of language escapes to the exactitude of algorithms, what in language exceeds the exchangeability. That is the point. After Occupy comes the automaton. What is the automaton? The automaton is, if I can say so, the connection of big data captured from the daily life of the people and devices of artificial intelligence that little by little are transforming the future into a forced replication of the present. This is the automaton, and the automaton is taking a growing place in our daily life, and most of all, in our mind, in our linguistic exchange, and so on, but simultaneously. In the scene of the world, you see, on one side, you see the global cognitive automaton. On the other side, you see the spreading psychosis of suicide. You see chaos. You see the chaotic force of humiliation, vengeance, and impotence. So, this is the, 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 the scenario. Of the, car, of, the, of the world nowadays, the global cognitive automaton and chaos. You see, the excess is there. The excess is not cancelled. The excess is uh, absorbed by the automaton, but uh, the body, the psychotic body of society is continuously escaping this total reduction Tony Negri calls it the multitude. Mm -hmm. But the multitude sometimes sounds uh, as a sort of, uh, uh, of positive uh, um, ersatz of solidarity. Nothing to do with positive. Nothing is positive here. Nor the automaton, neither automaton nor chaos. The only, the only line of escape is, uh, I call it poetry, is the excess that language keeps in itself, the excess of language in relation with exchangeability, what cannot be exchanged. This is poetry. And poetry can become the tool for, for therapy for the self-healing of the cognitive body. Good, I would open you over first. Yeah. We're searching for a microphone, and then... So, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I just... I just wanted to know how, how long do I have, because I actually have an argument, and I was invited personally by B4 to come today, so I feel like kind of privileged. So if I take a couple of extra minutes, I hope I don't like, um, you don't mind. Uh, you're amazing in describing this nightmare. Amazing. And we need you. We need you to give us this, this dark, dark scenario, because we need to keep that in mind. But. What, I mean, there's a lot to talk about, and I'm going to be brief, but what's missing from your, what's, what's missing is the dreams. And, and I also agree that, like, hope is not the right word. That, that part, I agree with. Hope is just like, because I also don't have hope. But 
dreams is, is a different category than hope because dreams are unconscious. You know, like they're not like something willingly you, you rationalize. They just come to you, right? And what came after Occupy, true, it was automaton. But first of all, this automaton is mostly American. It's American companies. It's American corporations that are extension of the American state. So American state is expanding, true. And I'm going to be blunt. Yeah, it's America. America's expanding in the world. America is not because these corporations are under the rule of American government. At any moment, American government can can extract this information and use it for whatever purpose. Doesn't need to. They're doing their job for American government. No problem, right? And power is actually concentrating in America. America wants you to think that, oh, America's going down, falling apart. Look at, look at Trump. Trump is like the sign of America going down. No. Trump is a sign of a rich guy who's, who can afford so much that can just give his credit cards away to people to blow money. S Trump is a sign of an excess of power in America. And he's so much power that he doesn't care that an idiot is sitting at the top because what is he going to do? He's just going to lose 10 billion? No problem. We have hundreds of potential billions coming in the future through this automaton, through this system we've set up to colonize the mind and the body of the world, right? But at the, at, at the same time that the power concentrates in America, what came after Occupy, my friend, was Bernie Sanders. You forget him. You forget Bernie Sanders. You forget the fact that what came after Occupy was return of socialism, democratic socialism to America. We have not only a, a, an old white man that has a white hair like you if he could grow his hair, but we have colored people like Ocasio-Cortez, like Elon Ormar, who stand in, a, in the middle of the Congress and say the truth that has not been spoken since 1950s when the last socialist was, was bad named and kicked out of the parliament uh, because of some reason, right? We have the rise of the Jacobin magazine. We have the rise of the democratic socialist. So that's not a hope to me, but that's a dream. And because power is concentrating in America, that's why this election in America is the most important thing. Because if we can, if we can somehow, and I mean, arguments of Sanders from the last four years is already making like people like Elizabeth Warren, whether she's fake or real, we still don't know. These arguments have reached to the level at the center of the empire. Short break for translation, you know? Right? It's very difficult to I mean, just a moment. Right? So, so we really need to keep this dream. I understand. We really need to keep it. I understand. Should I answer? Yes. No. Ah. <laughs> Good. Mohammed. In a sense, I totally agree with you, but the problem is that America is not a geographical place or a political system. America is the name of the automaton. Look at China in Xinjiang, just to name a place that you know. Look at China in Xinjiang. Is it or is it not the perfection of America? I mean, the global cognitive autonomy, the subjection of uh, the face, of the voice, of the life, of the mind, of every single person in the world. This is not America in the sense of the United States. No, it's America in the sense of the Protestant erasure of the possibility of uh, the singularity of the body. I say Protestant or Puritanical because I like the historical and anthropological analogies. But what is the point? The point is that in a certain moment of the human history, at a certain moment, uh, a, a group of bigot, of bigots, fanatic, went beyond uh, the Atlantic Ocean, followed by a flow of criminals, and they destroyed, they totally destroyed any sign of life, of human life in that place, different from the cruel Spanish civilization in Southern America. Spanish that I don't consider good guys, 
had the, the strange idea of asking about the soul of the natives. Should we consider those small guys uh, uh, as humans or not? If they are humans, we have to save their souls and their body. Northern Puritan Americans did not ask that kind of Baroque question about the soul of uh, the natives. They destroyed everything. But this is not a problem of the United States of America. This is a problem of modern capitalism. This is the problem of the capitalist destruction of the possibility of uh, singular intelligent life. The reduction of life to the repetition of an exchanging uh, uh, figure of, of something. I, I call it the neo-human. The neo-human is now transforming in a very deep way the very possibility of uh, a, 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 the human existence. And I call it the, the global cognitive automaton. But beware! Do you think that, uh, that Google or Facebook or Amazon belong to the territory of the United States of America? I don't think so. I think that the United States of America belongs to the territory of Google, of Facebook and of Amazon, like Austria, like Italy and like China and Xinjiang. Just behind you is the next question now. Thanks. Uh, you, you, you use this word apocalypse, but can it, can it be used without Messiah and Messianism? I mean, you know, theologically and theoretically. I don't understand. I was um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Stava chiedendo um, se la nozione di apocalisse, apocalisse si può anche leggere in chiave messianica. Sì. Sì. Sul, sul messianismo. Yeah. Yeah. Second question. You put a lot of uh, importance to the cognitive labor. I mean, non-material production and so on. Can you comment on, uh, you know, because from the perspective of Marxism, what matters is the real production, where the surplus value is produced, which is mainly in China. And from the point of view of Chinese factory workers, the communism is already there, already, already present, you know, is, is ready at the hand. So how, is it, how, how can we break that, you know, deep alienation that, you know, working class believes they are already in communism? You see, in, in communism, in, in, you know, communism is, is in the process of realization, so to speak. First, uh, I have something to say about the messianic key of interpretation of the present. I know uh, I'm not an economist, I'm not a politician, so I can, I can say crazy things like the messianic, but, 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 the, did you see the movie of Nanni Moretti titled Abemus Papa? Huh? That movie, that, I, I am not a fan of Nanni Moretti, believe me, but when I saw that movie, and especially when some months after that movie, I, I saw the German Pope bending his head and accepting his own depression, I thought that the big messianic key has something to, to t tell us. Then I saw the Sorrentino's movie, The Young Pope, which is a movie about uh, cynicism and truth. And then I, 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 I saw Francesco uh, um, in, the, in the first presentation to the people of Rome, saying, I am the man who comes from the end of the world. Then I saw, maybe you saw it, the, the, the dove, the white dove launched by the ends of the Pope, 
aggressed and killed by a black crow, and I started to be, in a sense, uh, overwhelmed by the force of that kind of messianic symbols. Forget about it. Let's speak about Marxism and China. Um, but you, I'm joking, of course, but I am also suggesting that we are dealing with the planetary unconscious. And the planetary unconscious is, um, you know, someone thinks that the, the creation of the uh, a cognitive network in the world, the internet, the collaboration of brains. This is uh, producing the new world. Yes, it's true, it's true. But uh, let's not forget that the global brain has a global unconscious which is starting to, to crazily speak in, in this time. So the messianic makes part of, of, the, of the unconscious. I think that uh, we need, of course, a, a critique of the political economy, but we also need a sort of psychomanteia, a sort of uh, psychoanalytic uh, perception of what happens in the unconscious of the global brain. Then you tell me that China is the proof that uh, um, the, the, the real economy still exists. That is only partially true. You know, in the last 10 years, China has destroyed 5 million uh, industrial places. The deindustrialization is rapidly happening also there. China is no more the factory of the world. The factory of the world is slowly vanishing or is continuously displaced from a place to the other. The, the factory of the world nowadays is much more in Africa than in China, and China masterminds what uh, uh, this kind of African new factory. So, and most of all, when you, when you compare China and communism, I, I would say, well, that has nothing, of China has nothing to do with that kind of communism that Marx is speaking about in the second volume of Grundrisse, in the fragment on, mach of ma of, on machines, where he speaks of the possibility of a, of a, a slow abolition of work thanks to the application of technology. This is the possibility. My communism is that possibility. The possibility of getting emancipated from work, thanks from labor, thanks to the full application of the potentiality of technology. Someone can answer or can tell me, oh, you are obsessed with this question of labor. There are so many problems in the world, war, uh, psychopathology, and uh, suicide. Why focus so much on work? You know, when I say liberation from work, I don't mean only that we should work less, but I also say that we should be able to emancipate our activity from the tangle of work. Think to education, think to therapy, think to all those kinds of activity that are labeled work. The laborization of human activity is the root of this kind of, psycho, of massive psychopathology, freeing time from work essentially means re finding again the possibility of leaving time as a time of pleasure, as a time of intellectual exchange, not as a time of of, uh, of exploitation, of acceleration, and so on. 
Maybe I missed something in what you said about China. I did. But we always miss something. In, uh, there is an excess. In. Are there, here's another uh, question. Thank you. So, um, I was uh, listening to the parts um, where you spoke about automaton as a metaphor, um, trying to understand whether you identify automaton and the global collective automaton as one body, or these are two separate bodies, in the sense that you call America a global uh, automaton, and you also call the cognitive labor and the bodies, if I'm not mistaken, that are involved in this label as an automaton. Mm -hmm. What is the relationship, whether it's uh, one body or it's a separate bodies, mm -hmm. uh, what is their relationship and what is your perspective on the relationship of structure versus agency here? Mm -hmm. And last but not least, <laughs> uh, the um, psychotic bomb of the society that you're mentioning. And where you show the way to escape through a poetry of it. Uh, does, does it involve also the, the body of non-humans and how you perceive the agency of non-humans non in this? Thank you very much. You give me the possibility of trying to be more clear. Uh, in, well, when I say uh, global cognitive automaton, um, I like this kind of frightening uh, words. Uh, I like to be frightened. And uh, um, when I say global uh, uh, um, cognitive automaton, I am I'm not identifying it with the, the general intellect. On the contrary, I think that the, the general intellect that Marx speaks about uh, in the fragment of mach on machines, uh, is the subjective, collective uh, um, agency of capitalist production, but uh, in a way which is an embodied, embodied way. I mean, the general intellect is us. We and 100 million of cognitive workers like me and you in the planet, we are daily renovating the machine. But in this process of renovation, there is a, 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 a sort of homologation, homologating agency that you may call capital that transforms our activity into the global automaton. So, things... Uh, may be uh, uh, considered uh, blocked, a sort of uh, transformation of intellectual life into an automaton. The problem is that there is an excess in, in it, and this excess is uh, the unconscious of the hive mind, the unconscious of the general intellect, suffering. Presently is suffering, suicide, depression, that is the unconscious of, uh, of, the, of the, the global automaton. And uh, we, we have to start from this excess, which is suffering. So the agency of this possible differentiation, of this possible autonomy, if I may say, is the, anim the animal side of, uh, of, um, of the body, of the general intellect. What in the body of the general intellect cannot be reduced to its automation. That is the, the, the point. And obviously, we have to translate this kind of uh, schema hmm, into a political process. I say political just because I want to say subjective, conscious, collective. Huh? And uh, this is the transformation of the possibility into potency. This is the conundrum that we are unable to resolve. 
I am a neighbor. I don't know about you, but my impression is that nobody at the present is able to transform the possibility into political potency. This is why I say, well, the apocalypse is here and is coming to transform the relation between the unconscious, the suffering unconscious, and the, the conscious body of the general intellect. Um, you know, I, I referred uh, to the works of uh, Catherine Malabou, a French uh, psychoanalyst and philosopher that I consider absolutely important for her. She speaks of neuroplasticity and uh, another philosopher, Dana Haraway, is working about it in the last uh, crazy book titled Staying with the Trouble. She says, uh, yes, maybe that the humankind is doomed. So what? The point is that there is a, a transforming agency inside the human subjectivity that can be able to invent the new form, the new conscious form. The problem is that, uh, and I go back to Catherine Malabou, in order to shift from the present situation of impotence to the renovation of political potency, a trauma has to happen. A break in the repetition of the global autonomy. Automaton. My sister, who is a psychoanalyst, told me once, uh, some months ago, beware, the trauma generally is not good. I know, I know the trauma is not going to be good. The trauma is never good. But it's not my fault. The trauma is already here. Are there any more questions? Perfect, then thank you very much, uh, Franco, for your talk, and thank you for your interventions. <laughs> um, well done.